Um, so it started for me when I was 17 years old, sitting at home, bored, and wanting a new project to work on. And so I thought to myself, um, I was always very interested in robotics and working, working on uh, robotics as a child with, with things like Lego and Meccano. And I had this thought in my head that if I was to ever lose a hand, I would lose the ability to pursue my passion of making things. And this strange little thought um, gave me the drive and the motivation to try and make a robotic hand uh, with the bizarre view that in the event that I ever lost a hand, I would then have a spare. And uh, I started looking for things around the house to start, start using to make this. And I threw something together using old bits of cut up aluminum, string and um, hobby servo motors. And uh, this was what I came up with and it was very cool. It worked just about and it, it moved very realistically. And this is the thing that fascinated me so much about, about this problem and in robotics in general is, is when something looks creepy then you know that you've done a good job in robotics. When I first got this to move, it was very, very creepy seeing a disembodied hand moving around on the desk. So I knew I was onto something. And I went to study at university. And at university, you need an excuse to work on these kind of things. And so I looked into it, and I found that that excuse for me was prosthetics. Um, so I looked into the price of prosthetic hands of advanced robotic prosthetic hands that were currently available. And this is a graph that shows some of the market leaders. Uh, so you have these incredible devices, these advanced robotic hands that can give amputees tons of functionality. Um, but, but because they're so advanced, they're also very expensive. So they can run anything from $50,000 to $100,000 to get something like this fitted. And what we're working on doing is trying to make advanced upper limb prosthetics, more affordable and accessible. So the price point listed on this slide is $2,000. Um, we're working towards getting it below $1,000, but this will be a start. Uh, but even at that, at that price point, it's, it's in vastly more affordable than anything that's currently available. And so the prototype I developed at university was this one. So it's a, a bit of a move forward from the previous one. This time I used precision techniques to cut out the aluminum parts. Um, and that's a cut-up rubber glove, um, super glued to the, to the hand to try and give it a bit of grip. And this still moved, moved in much the same way, but now it was actually capable of picking things up and manipulating objects in, in a way that far exceeded my own expectations. Um, so uh, despite this prototype being a big move forwards, it still had a problem in that it wasn't very repeatable. Uh, I uploaded videos of this to YouTube, to, um, to share it with the world, and the kind of comments that I was getting was people saying, I've lost a hand, I really want something like this, or I'm a maker, I could make something like this, could you send me the plans? But unfortunately, it was, it was still in a, in a stage where I'd kind of hacked it together somewhat, there, weren't, there wasn't a very well-formulated process to make it, and so I couldn't share the designs with anybody, I couldn't, couldn't give them the opportunity to do the same thing. And this, this was around the time that 3D printing was really starting to becoming more, become more accessible. And so I recognized this as the perfect way to create a prosthetic was, that was not only affordable and accessible, but you were able to share the designs and other people would be able to download them and make their own. So long as they had access to a 3D printer. And so this was the next prototype. Um, so this was another movement forward. It was using plastic. Um, much of the rest of the te technology was the same, but the benefit of using a 3D printer was that I was able to, to share these designs, and since then, they've been printed by lots of different people um, all around the world. And so this map shows all of the different countries that have been able to either, either print one of these designs or have offered design input or advice on how to further the project. And the quote there is from the, the mother of a young amputee who... Um, got in touch with us to say how much she wanted something like this and, and how much of a difference it would be for her son. And these are a few of the pictures from different people that have, that have made, made our, our designs so far. Um, the one on the right there is a guy called Taylor who um, is a, a US war veteran. And he's, uh, I think he's a quad, quad amputee, so he's lost all of his limbs. And his friend, who is very much a maker and a hacker, um, has started making 
our hands for his, for his friend Taylor. But it's such, such an incredible project to follow. Um, we've been updating them with new designs and he's, he's adding new, new components to it. Most recently he added a wrist to the design which is something we haven't had time to look at yet. And so this collabor co collaboration is really helping to move the technology forwards. Um, so we, the designs are open source uh, and by sharing them we're enabling other people to keep working on the technology and help contribute to its development. And so just to tell you a little bit more about the process, because it's more than just making a, a robotic hand, there's, there are a lot more things to consider. Those figures I showed you on the slide weren't just the cost of the hardware, it's the cost of getting the thing fitted. So we're looking at these problems at the same time. And what we've, what we've been doing is using commercial 3D scanning technology to take a scan of an amputee's arm and then 3D print a custom fitted socket. And so this shows the, shows the process broadly speaking. So we take, a, um, take somebody's arm, take a 3D scan of it, which gives us a, a mesh that we can manipulate on the computer. And then from that, we can essentially subtract their arm from a tube, and that gives us a perfectly fitting socket. And so we did this for Dan. Um, so this, this is Dan, uh, which is, this is actually the first time he shook his brother's hand. Um, so there's, there's a video here to show you that moment. Hopefully. I first met Dan about eight months ago. He found me online and robotic prosthetics have always been something he's really interested in. We met up with him in a pub quite recently to find out what he hated about his prosthetic hand. This is actually his hand. <laughs> um, and what he really doesn't like about it is how clunky it is, how heavy it is. Today is going to be what I believe is the first time anyone has ever used commercial technologies like 3D printing and 3D scanning to create and fit a robotic prosthetic hand to an amputee. I was slightly nervous because I'm worried I might break it because uh, I, I used to do that with the old Meyer electrics and stuff but yeah I'm really excited. My mum's going to probably kill me for saying this but when I was a kid I used to get prosthetic hands just so I could have time off school because I hated it. Yeah. Wow. Yes. That's perfect. Does it? That feels like, you know when someone's broken their wrist or something, you know one of those, um, oh, I've broken my arm, but yeah, I've got one of those. Yeah, you can try to play this one. Yes. It's already better than my hand right there. It was so weird to be able to just clench and then hold that person's hand, especially being close to my brother as well. It's, yeah, it's quite emotional in a way, because it's just like, yeah, I finally can shake and it feels right, you know, it's, it's good. It felt so, so real as well. Like, actually, like, it was, yeah, actually him grabbing me yeah. rather than the machine. You know, I want to be that person to show people you shouldn't be afraid of who you are. You know, it just feels like just nice to be able to help and it's going forward in the future, so, yeah. Thank you. So that was obviously a really heartwarming moment for us to see the work that we've been doing for, for over a year by this point actually translate into a, a real world emotional moment for somebody. Um, but we still had a lot of pro um, problems at this point and uh, we realized that I'm from an engineering background and I had, had been taking an engineer's approach to solving this problem. But the, the problem of um, amputations is not an engineering problem, it's a human problem. And so really we should have been speaking to humans. And so that's what we did. And we spoke to a number of different amputees. By the time of making this chart, it was 30 amputees and, and nine prosthetists and, and people in the industry. Uh, by now, it's well over 100. Uh, but the, the, uh, the key things, the key data emerged very quickly. And that was that the, the things that they needed from a, an, an advanced prosthetic wasn't necessarily the funct functionality. It was things like the weight and the look of the device. Um, so we, we started trying to look into these things a little bit more. And the first one I'll talk about is the look of the thing. So uh, one of the things that we did is try and make this look, look a little bit more inspiring for kids. Uh, so this is an Iron Man concept, and it, it glows in the middle. So it even starting to have some alternative functions beyond those of a human hand. And uh, here are some other designs too. And these kind of things that might sound a little bit, a little bit gimmicky, 
um, are actually incredibly beneficial to an amputee. Firstly, from a psychological perspective, if they're, they go from seeing themselves as having something missing, if they've got a function that you don't have as somebody with two hands, they then have a device that is in, in many ways better than yours. Um, so it gives them that psychological benefit of feeling more sort of complete about themselves. Um, but there can also be functional benefits as well. So for instance, we're looking at putting a, an optical sensor in the palm of the hand and then using it as a Bluetooth mouse. And then, then the person doesn't have to hold a mouse with their um, robotic hand and they can use their other hand for the keyboard. Um, so for things like gaming and in generally computing, this could be a huge, huge benefit. Another one is having the, the microphone and speaker in the, in the uh, thumb and pinky. So they can use it as a wireless handset. And that means that they can free up their other hand to do stuff. If you think about it, when you're on the phone, a lot of the time you're doing something else with the other hand at the same time, which is something that at the moment um, a hand amputee may not be able to do. And so that sort of, uh, th this was the, the prototype that that led on to. And um, this is our Swarovski crystal encrusted hand, modeled by Grace there. And uh, this, we painstakingly hand glued 3,000 Swarovski crystals onto this thing. <laughs> so I hope she appreciated it. I know she did. But uh, this was a way to try and give, give Grace some individuality to her prosthetic. She, she's a congenital amputee, so she was born without her right hand. And she's never worn a prosthetic, never needed one, still doesn't need one. And the only circumstances under which it would be of use to her is if it looked really, really cool so she could wear it on a night out and show it off to people. And so this fit the bill for her. Uh, so one, one of the other big problems that we had with this original prototype was the, the weight of it and the clunkiness. And so we needed to make it light. And if you think about an analogy with computing, this makes a lot of sense. With computers, we had desktop computers, which are a huge, were a huge advancement at the time, enabled us to do uh, tons of things to do with work, but it always stayed in the office because it was, it was too big to transport back and forth. And then it moved down to laptops. We had the same functionality, but in a, in a smaller and lighter package. And so then people would move their laptop between their office and their home. But it was only when the smartphone emerged with the same functionality again, but in a much smaller and lighter package, that we carried, around with it, carried it around with us all of the time. And the exact same idea applies to prosthetics. So if it, it can do anything in the world, but if it's too heavy, they won't want to wear it. They'll get tired and they'll leave it at home. And so this was a huge issue for us, and we started looking into how we could solve it. And so, uh, we've been working on this little miniature robotic hand as a, a little bit of a side project, bit of a distraction when things were getting difficult. Um, but the brief here was to try and make something that was fully functional, but was 3D printable in a single piece. And this makes a great little business card holder. Um, it prints in a single piece, and then you press the button and it opens, and then it will spring shut. And while it doesn't really have any functional benefit, it was essentially the first prototype for our, our next design, which, used fully, which was fully 3D printed in a single piece using these flexible materials. Um, so it has living joints. Um, this is the prototype being worn by Nicolas Houchet, who um, I think spoke at Hello Tomorrow last year. And there's a little video here. If you Code des trois mouvements. So par Oli de Open Bionics. Et donc là, j'arrive à, bah, tu vois, j'ai plusieurs banques. Je gère pas encore. C'est super la classe. Mais c'est trop de la balle. On s'avait vachement terminé. Eh bravo. Merci Bionix. Open Bionix. Open Bionix. Check out. Here he's pretending to be a robot. And by this point, we'd we'd added additional functions. So previously, it had just been opening and closing. And in the, in the little clip you saw before, he was for the first time experimenting with these different functions. And so you can see how much he loves playing with it by being able to do all sorts of different things. And so this, this final clip shows our, one, our prototype being worn by Nico against one of the market-leading robotic hands. 
So this was an index finger war. Index war. I'm not sure who won at this point. But you can see uh, the, the kind of, it's, it's not necessarily just the, the functionality that an amputee has, but it's the, the psychological benefit of being able to use it in new ways and, and show it off to people. So I'll just finish off with a quick demonstration of our latest prototype to show you how it works. So I'll roll up my sleeve so you can see what's going on. Just switch everything on. So here is being controlled by myoelectric sensors. And this is the same way an amputee would control it. Despite having lost their hand, um, so long as it's below about the mid forearm, an amputee still has the muscles that would have controlled their fingers and wrist. So they can operate this in a, in a really intuitive way. Um, so we can change different grip patterns, open and close like this. And the hand is completely 3D printed. And this one's, uh, the socket was printed to fit Dan. So this is actually his hand that I've borrowed. He doesn't mind. <laughs> so thanks very much. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening.